good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are seeing this recording today. My name is Latanya Jones, and I am the members editor for Embodied Philosophy. I am really thrilled to be with you all this way. Most of the time you hear from me through my writing to you, through emails, uh, and through our correspondence in our Circle platform. Increasingly, I'm spending more time with teachers who are coming to the Embody Philosophy platform to share their gifts and their lessons uh, with us. And so I am very, very excited to be communing with you all this way uh, in an interview conversation with uh, one of our teachers, uh, Natalie Malone. Natalie will be teaching yoga and social justice, embodying activism on and off the mat. She will be with us on Tuesday, August the 8th, the 15th, the 22nd, 29th, from 7 p.m. Eastern until 9 p.m. Eastern. And so I'm very, very excited to, to get this opportunity to speak with Natalie today and give you some more insight about what who, who your teacher is and what you will be uh, learning on your journey should you decide to join us in our August Wisdom School. So without further ado, I will introduce Natalie and officially bring her into the conversation. So Natalie Malone, pronouns she, her, is an MS 200 RYT. Natalie is also a doctoral level counseling psychology trainee, researcher, and yoga instructor. Her research prioritizes Black women's sexual, spiritual, and holistic wellness. Mm -hmm. As a yoga teacher, multi multicultural educator, and healer, Natalie intentionally integrates social justice, embodied healing, and holistic wellness into her work. Mm -hmm. And so, like I said before, we are very, very excited about uh, introducing Natalie to our community and all of us benefiting from the lessons that she will be bringing to us. So Natalie, I just want to start this off. I read your, your bio, but mm -hmm. uh, you and I have the uh, privilege of the fact that we are acquaintances. We know each other. We, you know, have been in some circles <laughs> together. And so I'm, you know, just personally really excited to uh, let the, the world get a glimpse of, of who I have seen in those, in those spaces. And so I'm curious today as we get to talking, you know, we have the bio that's here, but I'm really mm -hmm. curious as to who you are and how you find yourself in these healing spaces in the way that you yeah. show up. Yeah. I love this question a lot, um, which first of all, thank you so much for inviting me into this like community. Um, I've been exploring embodied philosophy since you introduced me to it, and I've been thoroughly amazed with like the content, the community, and all of the dynamic conversations. So I'm so grateful to be present and um, really give my gifts to this collective dream building and brain trust that's been created. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Um, and yeah, this question, it's one that I've been entertaining a lot because um, as a qualitative researcher, um, we spend a lot of time doing storytelling and positioning ourselves based on who we are because how we come to the mat, how we come to our research, how we come to clients is really informed by that. Um, so I've been exploring it. I think it's a very iterative process and um, Last week in San Francisco, I was doing some conversations around this topic, and I talked about myself as someone who is a lover, um, thoroughly a Pisces, as you know. <laughs> I have five placements in Pisces in my chart, for those of you who follow astrology, and my sun sign is also Pisces, so I'm very thoroughly a Pisces. Um, I'm a TT, I'm a scholar bay. I am a hot girl scientist. And for me, what that means is um, really like embodying what um, Dr. Candace Hargons and Dr. Shamika Thorpe have coined as this way of approaching science that's dynamic and about having a good time and sex positivity and all of these um, ways of existing that have been in aid to my black foremothers and forebears. So I show up that way in the academy. Um, and I'm a yogi. I'm all about being on the mat. I'm all about the philosophy of what it means to be invested in yoga as an embodied practice. And I knew there was something missing when I was writing all this out. So it came to me 
probably about three minutes before showtime. Um, and that's kind of just a part of my process. I was sharing before we got on here that I'm starting to divest from um, time as a linear construct and it's more circular. So because of that, I have to be really open to downloads happening at any given moment, mm -hmm. um, including three minutes before showtime. <laughs> and what it was is it was like, I'm an alchemist. Like, I'm really about like what, you know, some people in my generation call doing like the bad bitch witch shit. Like, that's my thing. <laughs> like, I, I believe in this power of like magic that's core to myself and my ancestry, my lineage. And I believe that that magic, which is very embodied um, word of the day is something that can be used for pleasure and for liberation. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how I'm showing up as of late. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to the things in the bio, I'm also a dog mom. I call myself a hot dog mom. So <laughs> I have a fur baby. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. we love our, we love our fur babies. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I love how you are, you know, showing up to this mm -hmm. conversation in the ways that you give us a glimpse of all that comes yeah. with you, all that makes you up. You know, I can hear that you're not one who's afraid. No. of finding more and more and more about yourself. And in that, what I've been finding is that I find more about the lineage in which, mm -hmm. you know, I come from, you know, what we would call witchy and things like that. Yeah. You know, yeah. these are ways that I'm just in contact with the divine and mm -hmm. using as tools to stay in contact with the divine. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I love that being the framework at which you approach your scholarly work, your research, mm -hmm. you know, your healing. Um, and I love he, that's refreshing when we're speaking specifically about yoga. I am not a yogi, but I am learning more and more and more about it. I had some notions about what yoga was mm -hmm. uh, from my perspective of hearing about it with my placement here in the United States. And mm -hmm. it just never really felt like a space that I could actually inhabit unless it was just mm -hmm. about fitness. You mm -hmm. know, and so over the last three years, I have been learning just a tremendous amount about the, 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 the spiritual lessons mm -hmm. that are there to carry us um, through yoga. So I was speaking with another one of our instructors and you may have um, heard of her, her name is Nikki Myers. And so mm -hmm. she will precede you in doing, um, our, appearing in our uh, wisdom school and just that understanding about the healing nature of it. Mm -hmm. um, really warms me so I may end up on a mat again yes I've done hot yoga but I may <laughs> end up you know really trying right. to let this thing work with me and yeah. so um you know you, you mentioned Dr. Hargons you mentioned another uh person and I happen to know Dr. Hargons as well who mm -hmm. else uh you know has been a part of your your journey of learning who would you say is mm -hmm. in your lineage yeah yeah um anyone who has coined themselves a black feminist or womanist in any way. Um, and for me, that's something um, I, I usually talk about as black feminisms, plural, because I think that there's this abundance of literature and art and all of these modalities that have been crafted from the minds of black women and gender expansive, expansive folks who see themselves within this construct of black womanhood. And like, you know, that's something that's really hard. I think a lot of times when we have these conversations, like we're using very like westernized terminology to explore expansive ways of existing and knowing, right? So um, I recognize that fluidity in it, but any of those folks who have contributed in that way, um, and that includes things like, Hip hop feminism, ratchet feminism, dirty style feminism, all of those things um, that have been core to who I am and how I've grown up in the world, but sometimes get washed away due to intersections of especially classism and elitism. Mm -hmm. Right. Because um, a lot of times when we talk about um, any form of feminism, it's kind of steeped in this academic understanding. And in that, we forget the ways that it's feminist work happening just to be sitting on the front porch getting your hair braided. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um, that's really important to my lineage. Um, anyone who's a pleasure activist, um, I say there were two books that like shifted my world when I started grad school. So one of them was Come As You Are by Emily Nagowski. And that was kind of like an introductory text by someone who was 
really like opening the door in her privilege to talk more about what sex positivity looks like, what it means to embody pleasure. And I think it was really good for me to start with that text as something I was familiar with through, um, I would say my academic conditioning. Then I bring in Pleasure Activism by Adrienne Marie Brown, which is completely divested from like everything I've ever learned. Um, mm -hmm. and beautiful in that way. Mm -hmm. So um, anyone who sees themselves within pleasure activism, I feel is very core to me. Um, and we were talking, we kind of started with, you know, the question of who am I? And I was bringing up astrology. So I've been studying that more closely. And um, there's a beautiful book called Sky Mates that's actually by a Black woman astrologer. And she really breaks down all the, the pieces. And my Venus being in Taurus has become really important to me in my relationship with pleasure because I like ease. I like comfort. Like all of those things that are wrapped up in what Adrian talks about, what Joan Morgan talks about, um, what Brittany Cooper talks about, like those are liberatory actions. And then when we bring that into embodied practices like yoga, you have your folks like Diane Bondi, you have folks like Jessamine Stanley, um, who are really talking about going to the mat as a place of rest. Like, sure, we can do the asana, we can do the poses, we can be involved in maybe a practice of rigor, but what does it mean for someone in my identities as a Black queer woman to come to my mat and choose to rest, mm -hmm. to choose the basana and let that be my state of existence and then take that into the world with me when I leave the mat? That's something I feel like I'm always telling my people. I'm like, you know, yoga is something we're in all the time. We come to the mat to practice. This is our playground. And that in and of itself is deconstruction work happening because a lot of times, um, particularly to your point around how yoga has been enmeshed with the fitness industry here in the West. Um, there's some conditioning around coming to the mat that is intimidating, that is stressful, that is kind of like, oh, we about to do this, huh? And really, it should be a playground, kind of like how I see therapeutic spaces to operate. Um, and I do recognize in that some of my mentorship and in coming into yoga, I was fortunate to work with um, a group of people who are now recognized as the Kentucky Yoga Collective. Um, and it was really powerful for me to be able to be in a space with women carrying so much privilege and have them really create a space carved out for me that's built with me in mind to learn my yoga and do that work. And I think that that's really important to uplift because a lot of times, um, I don't think we talk about like the white folks who are doing the good work <laughs> and like, not to say that I want to give extra amplification to whiteness because I don't, but I think kind of in the spirit of um, one of Bell Hook's texts, like we have to believe that people are capable and they showed me that it is in fact capable. So I've been very fortunate in that way. Um, and then to give them my gifts as well and see how that's blossomed over time. So Outside of those folks, you know, it's folks like Tamara and Elnora, all the way back to Lucy, uh, the people who hang out on my altar. Um, they they keep me going. It's people like Flovell and um, Gertie, who happen to be an Afro-Indigenous herbalist um, and someone I'm looking forward to connecting with more. Although I have one ancestor who says I need to do a bit more work before I can connect with her. So I'm a listen. I'm a listen or whatever, but <laughs> I can't wait to connect with her in the near future. So yeah, those are my people. I love how you are acknowledging that the connections, I think, mm -hmm. is, is really what you are talking about, especially when we are thinking about Blackness, we're thinking yeah. about, you know, whiteness um, and what that means. And especially at a time where we, it is of necessity Mm -hmm. that we come to some understandings and mm -hmm. recognize that we are connected mm -hmm. and that we do bring gifts to one another. You know, when I think about the ways that we have navigated racism and the structure, you know, I am reminded that white people mm -hmm. are also harmed by it. Yeah. Know, also yeah. harmed by the thing that has wielded so much power. Yeah. And you know, the idea of coming to the mat, mm -hmm. and those kinds of things being made possible through yoga, just again, mm -hmm. expand my mind about the possibilities of these types mm -hmm. of body practices, um, yeah. the purposes behind them, um, and the lineage in which it all can travel to this one mm -hmm. moment where we Absolutely. really are at a huge crossroads right now. So I know that um, you're 
you know, going to be with us. I, and I envision you being with us on several different topics. Absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, we're talking about social justice and I do a lot of writing on the site, um, trying to raise consciousness around social justice and what embodied practice means and um, healing around mm -hmm. issues like racism, especially, you know, for me, that is, that is my focus there. Um, how do you really describe the work of social justice right now? Mm. As necessity. Um, I describe it as necessity and something that has to have a three-tiered approach, I think. Um, and I describe it as something kind of in the spirit, there's a, um, Afrocentric psychologist whose work I really enjoy. Her name is Linda James Myers, and she's created this idea of optimal psychology and this idea that, um, and again, this is another one of those spaces where we're using perhaps dichotomous language to provide understanding around something that's a lot more broad in scope. But this idea that for many of us, we're existing in either optimal or suboptimal states. And mm -hmm. a part of moving towards an optimal psychology or an optimal way of existing um, means that we have to do this embodied work, like what yoga offers us to find liberation. So I mentioned a three-tiered approach. A lot of times when we talk about change and social justice and it being a necessity, it has to be a necessity at these three levels. So institutional or systemically, interpersonally, so amongst people. And I think that we have a lot of those conversations. Um, and for me, where I continue to find um, reservation or pause, whether that be in myself undoing things or in what I observe of others, it's really at that personal level. Um, and I genuinely think a lot of us just aren't in our bodies. And that's why I say it's necessity to move inward and really down into a root, you know, if we want to talk about subtle body energy and chakras and things, um, Unfortunately, the result of existing in a framework, particularly like what we have here in the West, is that we are so cerebral all the time that we don't even know the subtle messages that the body gives us. And our body knows that its natural state of wellness is a state where it can recognize the divinity in all things. Mm -hmm. um, and if we're truly in touch with that, I like to think that there can be a more mindful shift towards um just liberation, just towards betterment, just perhaps towards not doing that aggressive thing in the office if we want to make it more tangible, right? Mm -hmm. um, because I think these things can feel really like esoteric and like vague and hard to grasp. So I do a lot of work with people around just showing them like how energy shows up in their body and then how to transform that energy just to make a more mindful change in your everyday walk. And what does it mean if those kind of in the spirit of emergent strategy and the dandelions flying, like what does it mean when many of us start doing it at that personal level that goes to the interpersonal level and then ideally it changes the shift, the system at the top. Um, and that sounds like deep ass work and it is, <laughs> you know, it is. Very, deep, um, very, very important, you know, mm -hmm. just coming back to this, the fact that we are, there's a necessity for us to show up as whole, mm -hmm. live such fragmented lives, um, mm -hmm. the masks we have to put on, the, the code switching and, mm -hmm. and all of that, you know, um, I have found that it's just not conducive to a full, a fully lived life. It's, yeah. a, it's a half life. And yeah. so there are, you know, I love that I can feel that the consciousness is shifting mm -hmm. and very grateful. Mm -hmm. To feel like I'm a part of it and yeah. want to be a part of of that for myself and mm -hmm. for all of the littles that I mm -hmm. love and family and you know as mm -hmm. we continue to to evolve you know I yeah. think this is definitely a sign of of mm -hmm. evolution and so you mentioned your your black black feminism mm -hmm. um, <laughs> talked about yoga we've talked about social justice how does your your the Black feminism find mm -hmm. its connections, like deep connections to yoga, because mm -hmm. one might not automatically see that. You described it a little bit early mm -hmm. on, but I wonder if you could say just a little bit more. It sounds like an obvious connection. Yeah, mm -hmm. for me, <laughs> it shows up that way. Um, so I think it kind of starts, um, I was fortunate, I read a text by Stephanie Evans about in his memoirs of Black women's yoga history, and my favorite quote 
and I just, I throw it around everywhere. It doesn't matter if I'm talking, if I'm doing a presentation, um, but she's fortunate to have done really tremendous research and unearthed um, what we found in Africa to be a truth that black women have been saluting the sun for centuries. Mm. And I love that quote. It just like, it speaks to me on a whole nother level because um, you know, a lot of us, we think about Africa as the cradle of existence and this kind of expansion out, kind of going back to emergent strategy again. And it's like, what does it mean to know that all the way back through my lineage, it was a thing for my people to spend time in sun salutation. And perhaps it didn't look the way, you know, maybe it wasn't the sun sal A and B flows that we do in the studios right now, but it is an acknowledgement that that's always been fundamental. So that brings in the poses. Um, when we think about the importance of critical reflection or this idea of like critical consciousness and reflexivity, um, particularly as someone who's very informed in my therapeutic work via Black feminism, a lot of it is this iterative processing and reflection that has to happen that's then paired with praxis. So this idea of turning practice into action, turning theory into action. Um, and that to me parallels really well, um, which particularly this is going to depend on how you subscribe via yoga's philosophy. I'm someone who was trained under the eight limbs of yoga. So when we think about the yamas and the niyamas, for example, um, in some ways um, it's been distilled to think of as like the thou shalt's and thou shalt nots free of oppressive religious influence, just as a metaphor, um, that's the praxis that happens. So this calling that we have to not divorce yoga from all of the other pieces that are at play to make yoga truly what it is, here comes Black feminisms, feminisms to say, and we're going to hold ourselves accountable to doing that, which then brings us to community because there's a lot of we in our language, this idea of hyping up your friends. If you go back to like hot girl science um, and if yoga is indeed for everybody, then sure, we have our individualized practice, but we're truly doing ourselves a disservice to not do it in community with others or to not make it accessible to others, um, which is something I feel like I spend so much time um, thinking through for myself and discussing with others in the yoga community, particularly as it's um, been more aligned with traditional fitness in the West, like how are we making this practice accessible to the people it's meant for, which is in fact every space body, um, which then brings us to the work. And one thing about Black feminists, they've been doing the good work. <laughs> um, and it's a labor of love, of course, but that that work is highly necessary because in in the lineage of that like we're not free till everybody's free mm -hmm. we're not so there has to be something happening and for some of us that looks like just getting up and going to the mat and that's enough and then perhaps the next day it's a more concerted effort on behalf of many people Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's an important thing to highlight because so often social justice and activism, um, I think sometimes we think it has to be a very large demonstration and like it's the work to just exist in who you are in this climate and choose to go to your mat and rest and be that effective model for others and invite them to do the same. Mm -hmm. So in those ways, that's how the Black feminisms inform my practice and how I see it really related to yoga. You know, I've been at involved in activism mm -hmm. quite some time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have had the perspective of watching it shift. Yeah. This larger goal mm -hmm. to an understanding that if we are not well in our bodies, we cannot put our bodies even on the line for the things that we care about. Yeah. you know, or, or, or live so that we can tell the story and pass on yeah. information about how we were able to achieve whatever, you know, mm -hmm. it is that we've been called to do under this large umbrella of social justice. Because yeah. we're not just talking about racism, we're talking about right. environmentalism, we're talking about all of it. Yes. And, you know, and I have watched um, some of the health and well-being of people who were right next to me. Mm -hmm. And, the light is gone from the eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, dis mm -hmm. there's a disconnection. I know that mm -hmm. in really observing and, and taking in what happened in you know 2020 and yeah. around the world coming into you know the streets and 
proclaiming what we wanted, what would yeah. make this just. There were lots of deaths that occurred mm -hmm. to activists, lots of suicides mm -hmm. that happened from voices that you know were loud and the ones that people were going mm -hmm. to. You know, I noticed that we're trying to give certain movements a leader. I think we're yeah. evolving to an understanding that there is no leader, mm -hmm. uh, that this is all of our work. Mm -hmm. But we're losing people, not necessarily directly to to being in the street and you know state sanctioned violence or any of that, but yeah. their own you know hands. And so that for me um, also shifted me in the ways that I have to care about myself. I, I tell myself that the best offering that I can make is my well being. Mm. Mm -hmm. Everything else from that can spring up. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm very much hearing um, why the necessity of of yoga, how it really does connect to what I know what I've been taught in my lineage of Black feminism yeah. and, um, and how that can serve everyone. And I also love, you know, I'm, I'm recognizing that I'm still using the term social justice, um, mm -hmm. but where I'm moving toward is about liberation. Yeah. This work is about, it's not just about equaling the playing field. This mm -hmm. is about everybody getting free mm -hmm. you know that it's not reserved for anyone else and I can very much hear that in your um in the descriptions of the why you do the work and I never knew like something like that is possible through doing yeah. it you know I thought I'd get a couple of cuts here and there and you know no <laughs> it, did not happen. it did not happen yeah yeah good things came up for me though and like and you're saying that I appreciate you sharing that like I think so two things one um in that recognition of liberation, I'd read a text. Um, hopefully, by the time that we have, you know, this available to folks, I can identify it and we can maybe put it in the caption or something. I like to uplift names and texts where I can. Um, but it was someone just kind of speaking to, like, you know, every time we say, even if it's decolonization or something of this the sort, like, you know, words are spells. And what does it mean to even shift away from that and just call it working towards liberation? What does that mean? And that really stuck with me, um, particularly when we think about the calls that we do when we do have a more forward facing activist standpoint, which then brings me to my second thought, um, something that my mentor often told us was, you know, we come to the mat to find steadiness and ease or this idea of Sathira Sukha. Um, and what does it mean for someone who is consistently involved in that work? Because so many of us, we're going into spaces, whether it's out in the community, in our jobs, wherever it may be, where we're doing this work. And at some point we have to find some steadiness and ease in doing it. So mm -hmm. how can you find that and cultivate it um, in your practice and then use that in your daily walk? Because mm -hmm. again, the mat is just the playground to bring it back into the world. Um, you know, perhaps the chair poses a bit of therapeutic discomfort and... <laughs> If we can mindfully be there and shift towards something different, how does that translate into what you do in the real world? So and this yeah. all gets prepared. And that's what I love about your the title that you selected, uh, mm -hmm. Environmentalism on and off the mat. Like this is a way of living. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. many of us who have been brought to this work just out of birth, you know, yeah. So we have to, it's out of necessity. It's so that I can live. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that. Like I have to be on my toes wherever I am, you yeah. know? Um, but it also expands the, the point that I could see for your students that it's not just about being in the streets, mm -hmm. you know, or raising your voices mm -hmm. and it, or, or being on your mat and, you know, mm -hmm doing it for fitness or for whatever draws you there. If you are mm -hmm. interested in liberation, this is what we live. It's not a, it's not yeah. a theme. You know, I can very much, um, I can very much hear the, the, the message in that, that we, you know, I've, I've heard if I do it one place, I will do it everywhere. And so yes. my, what I'm trying to get at is being more healthful wherever I am, more mm -hmm. aware of how, you know, another activist, another issue intersects with whatever my, you know, major concern is and mm -hmm. speaking back to that, you know, connection again. So, so we've talked a lot about Black feminism, talked about mm -hmm. yoga, mm -hmm. you know, talked about social justice as, you know, really what we're talking about is liberation. Yeah. Um, 
what can a student expect who is new to activism? Maybe they are not black. Maybe they don't have you know the same um, lineages that you and I might have in common right now. Um, why why would um, a, a person who is is not black or does not mm -hmm. identify as black feminist uh, benefit from being mm -hmm. in a workshop with you about social justice? Yeah because we're ultimately all influenced, unfortunately, by the same systems and they influence us in different ways. Um, but that understanding of how starts with the willingness to learn and try. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the ways that has been successful for me in the past in doing this work is, you know, starting with this idea of self-study, which we know is core. If we think about um, what meditation offers us, what mindfulness offers us, um, you have to have that willingness to exist in your body and in your things as a starting point. Um, and then we pair self-study with language. So um, I'm a little bit of a stickler with language. I can be the grammar police. My friends like to tell me that when I'm texting, <laughs> but it, um, I'm really peculiar about why we're using a word and how it shows up for us in our way of knowing. Um, I'm one of those people, whenever I'm writing, sometimes it can be like an adjective or a word that I may use often. And I'll always kind of pause and just look up different definitions to see how I'm coming to it. So one of the things that I've noticed with social justice is that there, there are a lot of like $12 words that we throw around without taking the time to um, look at them as key concepts and understand how we arrive to them. So what that means, um, and I say this because for many of us who are existing in black and brown bodies, it's been necessary to understand the words and why we come to it right? Like there's a reason we say we're black and brown. There's a reason we say we're people of the global majority. There's a reason we say we're queer. Um, so, and particularly when you've been in a space where privilege was something you were born with, maybe that same self-study hasn't had to happen. So let's take a step back and look at those terms. We'll look at the terminology, see how you arrive to it. And that really sets a really good foundation to then go deeper into this idea of social justice, maybe being something that is a sacred duty to all of us or this idea of Dharma. Um, so once we have that foundation, we can then take ourselves to the mat more intentionally, um, both as an experiential practice and as something that we can talk about together in community. Um, pairing the conversation with actual practice is important for me because what I've found is as we're getting deeper into our bodies, it necessitates being in your body and doing the things. Um, so doing that together and then allowing that foundational knowledge to move towards historical study. So I'm someone, as I'm pursuing ease, what I like to give to people, no matter who their identities are, is a reminder that we, again, are existing in circular time. And there have been so many before us who have laid out groundwork and fundamentals that we can look upon and use moving forward. So we do the history of exploring, like, how has this been done in the past by different types of people? How is it being done in a contemporary sense? So then people have the bandwidth to see what options are actually available. Um, for so many folks, particularly those who haven't been involved in social justice and activism work, I think it can be very intimidating. We don't always realize the small ways that we can do this work in our day-to-day -day process that actually don't require much energy or bandwidth. Um, and then last but not least, taking that towards transformation. So I always want to be sure that going back to Black feminism, the ideas of praxis, that we're identifying with our collective brain trust what this looks like for you as the individual. And then what type of supports do you need to ask for moving forward? Because it's not just a one-stop shop, we get it, we're done. Like there has to be some comfort with knowing that this is a very iterative and ongoing process that you will mess up. And that's mm -hmm. something that we deal with in step one. So by the time we get to talking about what your transformation is gonna look like, you've made some peace on the mat with some of those things and what they mean. Just like how some of us might be pursuing certain poses and maybe it'll happen in this lifetime and maybe it won't, but can you make peace with that and be okay? Mm -hmm. So um, that formula for me, I'll say has um, so far been really successful and I'm interested in continuing it, continuing to offer it to a variety of folks and getting their feedback because I think another benefit of learning with me is that I'm a forever student. I learn from the people I'm in community with. Um, there is no hierarchy that exists. So um, even having the opportunity to arrive to something that might be intimidating and me affirming that you actually are an expert. Mm -hmm. We're just going to figure out why <laughs> you might not know right now, but there's some gems in there. So we're going to pull them out. 
And I think those are some of the benefits. And so, you know, we have an, uh, an international audience on our platform. Mm -hmm. We're very grateful to have that. Um, we also, people are coming from various walks of life. Yeah. Some may have tried yoga in the past, some who are yogis, uh, some who have practiced and left the practice. Mm -hmm. um, and some who have just considered that they're they're interested in more of our mind body mm. uh, studies portion of our website. Uh, is this a space for someone who is just starting out? Like, do mm. I need to know how to do any of the poses when I show up? Or, you know, is yeah. it, do I need to be practiced in social justice, yoga? Mm. Can I just, how can I show up? Mm -hmm. You can show up with the willingness to name those things and be authentic in them and trust that myself and this community will meet you where you are. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good sentiment to take with us anywhere. Just mm -hmm. trusting that anybody I come into contact with, I need mm -hmm. to be able to, to meet them. Mm -hmm. They are. And that in itself takes practice. Cause and sometimes I, I know how you're right. supposed to, I don't right. want and it's reciprocal too, because it's like, you know, I don't, I don't expect folks to go around like throwing their trust. So I think in that is this piece of like, I'm being intentional in naming that it'll be an invitation in. So, because for so many of us, like trust has not been, it's been robbed from us. Like there's so much psychological harm that practices in spaces, including yoga studios, you know? Um, and it's a lot to put yourself in a vulnerable position to, to, to hear from someone, to be led by them. Um, so that invitation is there to establish that trust. And I hope I may facilitate it. And in that there will be conversations about like, how can I ensure, how can we ensure that this space is what you need to have the level of trust that you want to give? So, and I just want to name that because, you know, people, it's a big thing to give something your trust. It's huge. And I don't think we talk about that all the time. And it's a beautiful thing to be invited. Mm -hmm. you know, and the, the invitation and you're making me think about the ways that people feel like they have to enter these issues that are affecting all of us. Like, yes, yeah. by virtue of my social location, by virtue of mm -hmm. my meaning of this brown, you know, yeah. black, in yeah. um, queerness like I've I've had to step if I wanted to survive I've had to you know become more aware mm -hmm. um but the fact that we have the opportunity to invite anyone into the activism mm -hmm. because it affects us all is mm -hmm. a beautiful thing to to hold on to like this is all of our work you know yeah. I just think that you are really reminding me of that throughout this conversation. So I am just thoroughly excited. <laughs> me to, too. Yeah, personally to see you do your thing on the on on the platform. But I um, as I said, my role here is about caring for our membership and mm -hmm. um and trying to bring in people that will do that. Yeah. At, teaching these lessons and so I'm really excited that our community will have the opportunity um, to be nurtured by you as they are guided and to um, you know decide to trust you if they can and honor it if they yeah. feel like you know yeah. that yeah. you know that that openness is there so so I really really um, am looking forward to your presence on our yeah. on our platform and with our students and I thank you so much for your time today with me uh, in talking about the workshop. So uh, Natalie Malone will be with us, you all, mm -hmm. on uh, in August. She's our August Wisdom School uh, teacher. And you're gonna be diving, in, invited into social justice, social activism, yeah. uh, liberation work. And mm -hmm. you'll be invited in through the mat. So mm -hmm. I think this is uh, just a beautiful time for all of us. And you will be able to find a link uh, to register for this course below. And I uh, really hope to see you in, in August. Thank you so much, Natalie, Thank you. for being here. We are excited to have you. I'm excited too. Okay, you take care. I will.